Hi guys, welcome to Group Management Leadership Strategy number two. Okay, so we looked at effective communication, okay, and the whistle was part of that, but the whistle was also a really important part of group management, particularly in Fox 40. Okay, so when you blow your whistle, we've, we've said how if you blow your whistle once, okay, then it means that they need to freeze, and if you, you blow your whistle twice, they need to come in. Usually you're going to do this when you want to give instructions, okay? You can give instructions in a little group when they come in and sit down like this, okay? It is so much easier to give instructions to a group who are sitting down in front of you rather than trying to give instructions to a group like this who are just in chaos. Usually if you blow your whistle, okay, when you blow it once, you want them to freeze, okay? And when they freeze, they look at you. They're not playing with the ball. They're not bouncing it. They're not passing it around, okay? They're not doing this, okay? When they're doing this, they're not listening. Okay, when they're doing this and they're not moving, they're completely um, under your, your spell, if you like. Okay, you have their, their attention and you can change a rule or you can incorporate something new into the game. Okay, so controlling your group with your whistle is of the utmost importance. Here they are again, sitting there listening, have a great, having a great time. Means that they get to come in and they, have, they get to listen to the instructions and go out and do more repetitions. Okay, if they're going crazy, you have to repeat it over and over and over and over again, okay? This is where they get to go out and boom, they get to play and they get more reps and they get better at the skill or whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. Okay, cones. We know that uh, we can color coordinate cones and it makes it easier for us to say, okay, go to the yellow thing, go to the blue thing. Okay, it's really important that you do that. Um, a lot of people won't. A lot of people just see that random cones and they'll say, okay, go and stand in the middle of the cones. The students don't know what cones you're referring to. Okay, they help us to provide a barrier or a set space where you want students to go and where you don't want them to go. Okay, so again, it's the set form of control. So you can see here when they come in, they sit down, you can say, come, sit down in this area and again undivided attention they listen okay you can make sure that they're not running around kicking balls etc etc if you don't okay absolute chaos ensues you know people don't listen they'll be running around with machetes okay oh, absolute carnage you don't want that you can also use our landmarks so we discussed this in class you can talk you can use sorry the lines on the um, on the court or, or wherever or there's, there's lines on a field there's lines in the gym Okay, all you need to do is tell them, go and stand over there in the half circle, go and stand over there on this thing or that thing. Okay, and again, boom, there's no chaos. Okay, they're not throwing stuff around, you keep an eye on them, and you can make sure that they're actually facing you. So here, we also used it as a barrier or as a, um, an area where you could and couldn't go within the game. You don't have to have cones in order to make um, you know, an, an area where, where you can play. So quite easily on this occasion, Okay, I said to these guys that you can play in the third of the nipple court. Okay, really basic stuff. So again, they know where to go. There's no confusion. They're not walking around. They're not lost. Okay, and they're focused. They know where they need to be. Again, they get more reps. They get more time on task. Alternatively, if you're bringing people in in a group, you know, again, you can say, come and stand on this thing or come and stand in a circle. I don't necessarily like this image. Um, why? Because the lady has her back to the students as well. Okay, so if you're going to get a kids in a circle like this, and some of you will, be part of that circle. Okay, so don't necessarily stand in the middle of it because you've got your back to some people and some students really need to see your face. They need to see your lips moving in, in order to understand. Plus, there's kids behind her. Who knows what they're doing? They could be doing absolutely anything. So if you're going to get the kids in a circle, get in that circle with them and stand with them. Okay? Selecting things. Okay, so this is an example of, you know, if you've got, this lady's got two kids up. Okay, and she said to them, okay, where you go, pick your teams. Okay, a terrible, terrible thing to do. What it does is it makes kids feel left out. There's always that kid or two kids who are going to be at the end, um, and they know, oh, then I'm not being picked because I'm not great. Okay, you're isolating them, you're making them feel stink. Their self-esteem, their self-worth drops. Okay, so how could you pick teams? You could number off. Okay, so you go along, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, or alternatively, as we've done a lot in class, you could use a paper, scissors, rock technique. So here's our kid here. Effective functioning is that the kid isn't being left out. Okay, they're not getting made fun of. All right, it's really important that we don't hurt kids' um, opinions about physical activity. Otherwise, they won't come back and they won't enjoy it. Okay, and they could be scarred for life. 
when you're picking them and you're numbering them off, try to get them to separate immediately, okay? You can see that we've got two clear groups here. Otherwise, kids will try to chop and change, they'll try to swap numbers. So be really aware of that and make sure they move immediately to where you give them the numbers to. The next one is bibs. You can control your team, you can manage your group by ensuring that they are wearing bibs. You can see what teams they're on. It's really hard to have any sort of team game, okay, if you do not have bibs. Your bibs also need to be washed, they need to be clean. You do not ask a kid to wear a bib that smells terrible, that's got weeks and weeks of other kids sweat in it. It's unhygienic, okay, and it's not nice. You wouldn't want to wear that yourself. Here in this image, you can quite clearly see that members of our class are wearing bibs. They're wearing them properly, and you can see whose team they are representing. You can see who each other's teammates are. Here's some examples of not that not very good bib wearing. So Dan's walking around with his bib in his hand over here. He's dropped it. Okay, he's actually not part of the game, and because of that, um, he's. The functioning of his team, it's affecting it negatively. Um, likewise, over here, you can see Zeke's wearing his bib around his neck, and that's more my fault than anything because the bib may not fit him or he may not feel comfortable in that bib. Okay, so he, you can see if, if you're in front of him, you can tell what team he's in, but from here, it just looks like he's wearing a, a lovely green scarf. So, you know, that's something that you need to do is actually supply bibs that, that, that fit and that the kids are comfortable wearing. Cool, so that's our group management, guys. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, make sure you come and see me um, or ask me to pick okay, a few of those to actually try to incorporate um, and develop throughout your coaching sessions. Okay, Hopefully that uh, makes the selection of that nice and easy. Come and see me if you don't know what you're doing. Cheers.